to so many of you. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Uh, you can find a, a seat this morning. And, and what I want to challenge us with is as we transition into God's word is sometimes, uh, sometimes we can do worship music and then sermon and it feels like you missed a gear while you're shifting a car. You guys know that feeling? You're like going up a hill and you kind of drop the clutch or something and you get the clutch chunk. I want to challenge you this morning that God's word is worship. We're going to continue in our worship with God's word open. Is that exciting news or what? Yes. Boom. We brought a Bible. There's some, one person who brought a Bible. So let's give Ron a round of applause. <laughs> you know, on, on a side note, last week, uh, Danny always says there's nothing better than the flipping of pages. The only sound in this church that's better than the flipping pages is the breaking of the wafer during communion. Oh my gosh, it gets me every time. Uh, well, welcome. I see some new faces. My name is Andy. I have the privilege of being the pastor of student ministries here at Bridge Community Church. And every now and then I uh, am invited and asked to preach. Uh, and I enjoy doing it. I'm especially grateful this Sunday that I wasn't asked to preach next Sunday. Because next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. And everybody knows that that is a lightly attended service. Um, <laughs> In pastor circles, next Sunday, whoever comes, we know those are the real Christians. So, <laughs> zing, let that fall where it may. <laughs> well, this morning, we're going to have some fun. Uh, there's three things that I love uh, about preaching on a Sunday morning. Number one is I love God's word. Number two is I, I love preaching. I, I like to prepare and I like to deliver uh, what we would just call a sermon. And the third is that I like to have fun. The first two, opening God's word, uh, I can do on my own and I can preach on my own. But the fun part is, is you got to dialogue with me. You got to be part of this with me. So if you're someone who's like, I express myself a lot during worship, but then when it comes to sermon time, I'm kind of closed off. This is an invitation. You can hoot, you can holler, you can throw a fist in there, whatever you want to do. It won't distract me. Uh, I enjoy it. So I'm going to feed off you this morning. We're going to have some fun. Yeah. Amen is right. Uh, so we're continuing a sermon series called Life Together. And as we discussed what life together is all about, we kind of came to this conclusion. Instead of trying to find Bible texts and force it into what we want life, to be, life together to look like, why don't we just let the word speak for itself? Let's visit some episodes in the life of Jesus and just see how does Jesus interact with people? How does he behave? How does he treat people? And what does that have to tell us about this community, the kingdom community, that God has invited us to be participants and citizens in. So we're going to continue that this morning. Before we jump in, I have to give you a little precursor about this morning's sermon. Uh, on Sunday mornings with the students at 9 a.m., we meet in the youth room in the back here, and we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Luke. And, you know, honestly, sometimes it's really exciting. Sometimes we get a lot of students who seem like they haven't slept in months. And it's, sometimes it's pulling teeth. Sometimes it's exciting. But three weeks ago, I, I showed up and I have not felt the tangible presence of God in the room with the youth like this for a long time. It started really simply. We just kind of prayed. We opened the Bible to Luke chapter 19. And I could immediately tell the energy was just different that day. And it, and it kind of started with some students asking some curious questions. And we're going to get to what those questions were because that's what the sermon is all about. Um, but one particular student asked me this question, and that really is where this sermon is rooted in. So this sermon in large part was written by students. And so I thought it would only be appropriate to invite a student onto the stage, the student who kind of asked the question, to read the scripture with us this morning. Would that be okay with you? So would you give Justice Prizio a round of applause? <laughs> okay, so this can be nerve-wracking. So he's not just going to read. He's, he's counting on you to read with him. Uh, he's going to be in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And he's going to do awesome. Take it away, Justice. It's all you. Okay. Follow along. Um, I'm watching. Okay, go. <laughs> Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. 
So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Awesome. Give Justice a round of applause. <laughs> So I was reminded this morning with the students um, that you can't take credit for what's not yours. So I also want to give some credit. Uh, Justice, Kate, Axtell, Kate, Kurame, they all said, don't forget our names, Melody, uh, Libby, Mia was there this morning, Noah Heron, Parker. Uh, there's, I probably forgot some, but our students are awesome. And, and I really do owe this morning's sermon to them because our conversation a few weeks ago really just kind of launched me into a, a headspace that I never even thought of. You see, we come to a, a text like Zacchaeus, and a, a professor of mine called Zacchaeus a felt board story. And, and a felt board story means that it's, it's been so common and so used in Sunday school that we just kind of breeze over it, and we don't really dig in there. Well, this morning we're going to do some digging, if that's okay with you. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, we're going to turn our, in your Bible to, to Luke chapter 1 or chapter 19, verse 1. And we're just going to kind of go verse by verse because I, I think God has something really important to say to us about being a community of people who are after his heart. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you have your Bible, it'll also be on the screen if you'd like to follow along. It says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. I, I want to pause right here because uh, I think every verse in scripture is just packed with meaning. This particular verse uh, stands out to me for a couple reasons. The first one is just simply this, is that Jesus' intention is to pass through. Scholars would say that Jericho happens to sit in between two pretty big landmarks, the Jordan River Valley and Jerusalem. So Jesus is just traveling through, and it says his intention is to pass through. You might know that sometimes our intentions to do things get interrupted by people. And we're about to see in this story that Jesus has no problem being interrupted by people. To be a community that follows after Jesus, we have to be people who say, you know what, we have plans. We're not people without, without plans. We, we are going from point A to B. We have stuff to do. But when people get involved, people are bigger than plans. The second thing I want to point out, if you, uh, you like your Bible, is this just doesn't happen in any old town. This happens in Jericho. Jericho is famous for one thing. I heard somebody say it. You can say it out if you want. The walls, says Phyllis. The walls. You see, Jericho is a famous town by this point. Jericho, it turns out, has been a, a town that was once known for its military might and its strength. If you don't know the story, I'll give you the Spark Note version really quickly. Do um, you guys all know what Spark Notes are? <laughs> yeah, it's like when you're um, in high school and you're trying to take a literature test, but you didn't actually read the book. You can buy the Spark Notes, and it takes like 15 minutes to read. And I got to tell you, it's only good enough to get like a D plus or a C, so don't count it. Read the book, kids. Read the book. But here's the Spark Note version. In the Old Testament, God has delivered his people out of Egypt. And they're getting ready to go into the promised land. He promised this to, to Moses. And as Moses uh, passes away, he, he transfers leadership to Joshua, who's going to take them into the land. And it's finally time. It's this beautiful, beautiful land. It has everything they need. It's milk and honey, which I, I still, I, I get it. That was like a big deal back then. But milk and honey doesn't sound that satisfying to me. I don't drink a lot of milk. I think that's why. Uh, so they're going into this land. But there's a huge problem. And the huge problem is called Jericho because this land isn't just empty and for the taking. There's actually already people in it. And it's not just any people. It's a people that Joshua chapter 6 tells us has spent an inordinate amount of time building a wall around their city. It's not only impenetrably thick, it's also extremely tall. And whenever there's danger, they just lock themselves in and there's no problem. And so Joshua says, God, I thought this was our land. What are we going to do? And God says basically this, throw a worship concert. Take the Ark of the Covenant. My presence will go before you. I want you to march around the city. I want you to worship me. I want you to sing to me. I want you to dance. And I want you to blow that trumpet. 
on the seventh day. And when he does, what happens? The walls come tumbling down, right? Fast forward about 1,500 years, and here we are. Jer- Jesus is in the town of Jericho. I, I, I tell you that story because I, I want to challenge us this morning. There are physical walls in our life, like Jericho, like you would have to drive through a wall to get to the 22 freeway. There's an actual wall. But then there's these other types of walls. There's spiritual walls. There's cultural walls. There's things that divide us from other people. And I want to challenge you this morning as we dive deeper into Luke chapter 19, if you're paying really close attention, you're going to notice that Jesus is going to start destroying some walls that we assume are there for a reason, and Jesus says they're not there for a reason. If we're going to be a community of people who are following Jesus, we better pay attention to what walls he's ready to break down. We continue this story in chapter 19, verse 2. It says this, A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. I, I want to pause right here. You know, many of you know the, the New Testament was actually written in Greek, but I, I think the English translators hit this one out of the park with that semicolon. Do you guys see the semicolon? Okay, let me read it to you. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, semicolon. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. All right, if you have a pen and some paper, this is, this is note-taker time. You ready for this? Because this is what happened three weeks ago in the youth group. We read this story, and then I turned to the kids and I said, what stands out to you? What's, what's heavy on your heart? What's making you excited? What question do you have? And this is what happened. Justice Prizio, who is just up here, said, what does Zacchaeus' name mean? And I said, ah, oh, geez, why do you always ask me the ones I don't know? So I, I, I thought about making something up, and then I decided against making it up, and I said, look, it's 2018, you have an iPhone, pull it out, let's find out. That's, frankly, that's what I said, let's, let's find out together. Uh, and so we looked it up, and this is what happened. I said, did you find it? He said, yes, I found it. What does it mean? And he read it off to me, and this is what happened. Mind blown. And I thought, there's no way that's what Zacchaeus' name means. If that's what Zacchaeus' name means, then this whole story is taking on an entire new life for me. Let me see your phone. So I look at it, and I realize this is not, this is a reputable source. This is the real thing. Are you guys ready for Zacchaeus' name? Zacchaeus' name comes from a Hebrew word, zakah, which is a good deep throat spitting word, zakah. And this is what it means. Are you ready for this? It means pure clean or without contamination. Now, now read this, read the semicolon with me again. A man was there by the name of Mr. Squeaky Clean without contamination, semicolon. He was a chief tax collector. Is anyone else seeing the irony here? (laughs) This story just went from like, oh yeah, I know the wee little man, a wee little man was he. This story is funny now. This story is funny. This, I want to read more. I want to know more about this. Why? Because an eighth grade boy had a curious question that totally shaped a story in a brand new way I never even thought about before. Zacchaeus, Mr. Squeaky Clean, happens to have an occupation that's not so squeaky clean, is it? Uh, I don't want to go into super detail. Many of us know this, but I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about being a tax collector. A tax collector at this time is under the umbrella of the Roman Empire, which is vast and enormous. It's so big, in fact, that Rome knows it's going to be impossible to truly collect taxes on people unless we come up with a plan. And here's their plan. We are going to sell the rights to collect taxes to an individual who can do all the hard work. So this is how it would work. They would send somebody to an area, a town, and they would say, for instance, Jericho. Their expected tax revenue is, I don't know, $10 million. Anybody in Jericho want to cut a check for $10 million, you can pay us up front, and then you can have the rights to collect as much taxes as you want. And here's the thing. You don't only just buy the ability to collect taxes off people, you buy the protection of the Roman government. And this is why it matters. Because you go into a town like Jericho, you find a little weasel like Zacchaeus who's willing to pay you up front, and this is what they say. You can mark up taxes as much as you want. And if anybody wants to do any physical harm to you, we will show up and protect your right as somebody to collect taxes. One last thing about 
Zacchaeus the tax collector. He's almost certainly Jewish in an area that is Jewish. He has willfully accepted that he's going to extort and backstab his very own people. Mr. Squeaky Clean, his mom wasn't very good at picking a name because her son is really royally messing up this name. It's funny, but it's also true. So this is who this guy is, okay? And then it goes on, verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Not only does his name equal the biggest irony that I've seen so far in the New Testament, not only is he an extortioner, backstabber, traitor, he's also short. <laughs> I almost considered like looking up on Google, is there a good clean church short person joke? And I decided against it. <laughs> so here's Zacchaeus. I got to tell you, I cannot imagine a world where a guy like Zacchaeus is not the punchline to a lot of jokes. If you've been walking on foot back and forth, which is the primary mode of transportation at this time, you've heard these jokes. Have you heard the one about the Jericho tax collector? Like, no, tell me that joke. Everybody sits around the campfire. I just imagine he's just the butt of every joke. And it says this. He's curious and wants to see Jesus. And I got to tell you this morning, this is a pretty darn good place to start being curious. And this is what he does. He runs out into the crowd, and as it turns out, he's too short to see anything. For most of us, I would guess that, well, I could hear about it on the evening news. I guess I'll just go home. But not Zacchaeus. He decides, I'm going to run ahead and I'm going to climb a sycamore fig tree because th that's the way Jesus is coming and I want to get a look at him. Before we move on, I want to pause and point out a couple things. Number one, if you're following the characters in the story, there is a crowd with Jesus and then there is Zacchaeus who is the only person outside of the crowd in the story. And he happens to be up in a tree getting a vantage point on Jesus that nobody else gets. Simply because he's curious and he wants to get a look. We're going to come back to that in a second. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Now in the first century, to, to run and to climb is not a dignified thing to do. To physically exert yourself is something for poor people. If you need somebody to uh, climb up in your tree and harvest your goods, you pay somebody or you buy a slave, frankly. If you need somebody to carry a message for you, you hire them or you send a slave. A dignified honorable, wealthy person does not physically exert themselves in public. So what Zacchaeus has just done, and what the first readers of Luke all knew, was he just dishonored himself on purpose. Why? Simply so he could get a glimpse of Jesus. Is that pretty cool? We're going to come back to this sycamore fig tree, but if you wouldn't mind just holding on to that idea of the sycamore fig tree, we're going to come back to it. So we have a problem with uh, Mr. Squeaky Clean. He's in a crowd that certainly knows him and certainly hates him. It's made up of people who have been taxed and extorted by him. And now he's up in a tree. It goes on in verse 5. It says this. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Hmm. I was taught at a really early age that you don't invite yourself over to other people's houses. <laughs> Anybody else have that? I, um, I had some friends who had things like trampolines, and I was always trying to subtly, you know, hint, like, you should invite me over, you should invite me over. I, I, this just came to my mind, so I'll just say it. I had a really good friend in high school. Uh, in fact, he was in my wedding, uh, my best friend in high school. His mom was one of, like, these Jedi master cooks. She could, like, open an empty fridge with, like, cottage cheese and hot sauce, and then two hours later, you'd get, like, a turkey and stuffing on the table, just, like, <laughs> on a normal Tuesday night. Uh, and so we wouldn't invite ourselves over for dinner, but, like, literally, like, five or six of us Multiple times a week, this is what we did. Hey, uh, I think we should study at your house. Yeah, let's study at your house. Because when it gets close to dinner time, we know his mom's going to come in and, <clears throat> and say, how many are staying for dinner? We'd say, well, i got a lot of studying today to do. I probably shouldn't leave. So yeah, I'll stay. That was kind of our way of inviting ourselves over for dinner. So Jesus invites himself over. Uh, 
But it just so happens that he does it in a culture where this is really, really cool. Because to invite yourself over as, as a guy like Jesus is to say, Zacchaeus, I need you to get out of the tree because I want you to host me. In a, in a culture that's all about honor and shame, to host somebody is extremely honorable. It's an absolute privilege. This is something that, that people dream of, getting to host somebody famous. At, at this point, Zacchaeus is probably seeing this, this itinerant speaker kind of traveling from town to town. He's famous. He has a crowd. Wow, you would do me the honor of letting me host you. And so that's what Jesus does. I must stay at your house today. Now I want to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail. So if you're sleeping, just continue what you're doing. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say any names, but also if you're playing a game on your phone, at least have the Bible app open in the background so if someone looks over, you can pretend you're on the Bible. I know who you are. I sit in a certain section. I know who you are. If you'd like to follow along, I'd, I'd like to invite you down a rabbit trail with me this morning. Um, if we could, um, there's a scripture, it's, it's from the book of Luke, and it's Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 45. I, w I wasn't planning on putting it up on the screen, I don't know if we can, but it's Luke 6, 43 through 45. I, I hope we can get it up on the screen. Oh, the sound of pages flipping. It says this. It says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of one's heart, the mouth speaks." This is what I want, want us to think about today. Jesus comes to a place, and there's this notorious tax collector up in a tree. Now, we know from Jesus' teachings, there's over 10 of them just in the book of Luke alone, about trees producing good fruit. And we know that when Jesus talks about it, he's not talking about literal trees, although he does at one point curse a tree that should have fruit and it doesn't, you might remember. He's talking about us. He's talking about human beings. And this is what he says about human beings. You can judge them, the tree, by the fruit that they produce. And fruit comes from within your heart, and it flows out of you. Is everybody following? Do the crinkled eyebrow face if you have no clue what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll find you, and I'll try my best. You judge a tree by its fruit. Jesus is saying people should be judged based on what comes out of their heart. Now, we're going to make kind of a jump, so stick with me here. Jesus stands at the foot of the sycamore fig tree, a tree that's notorious for great fruit, a tree that's notorious because if you were poor and you were down on your luck and you had nothing to eat, you could find one of these trees and it would feed you. It's a tree with very, very, very good fruit, except there's a problem. There is a very bad apple in the tree now, and his name is Zacchaeus. Are you following me? The entire crowd looks up in that tree and sees Zacchaeus and immediately thinks, that tree has terrible fruit. That guy, Zacchaeus, is terrible. If Jesus wasn't here and the power of Rome wasn't behind him, we would have axed him long ago. He doesn't belong with us. He's a traitor to his own people. He, he takes people who work a hard day in the sun, backbreaking work just to put food on the table, and on their way home, he taxes them to the point where they have to decide who in the family doesn't get to eat. The tree of Zacchaeus has terrible fruit to the crowd, except this is what Jesus does. Zacchaeus, I need you to come down immediately because I want you to host me in your home. When I read this, this is what I think. And I think this is important for us as we start to parcel out what it means to do life together. That if we're truly, truly going to know the fruit of people, it can't happen in a passing judgment. It can't happen just simply by looking at what someone does or what they put on their Instagrams or their Facebooks, although that's, that's important stuff. 
It, it can't be a quick snap judgment. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus looks at a guy who he definitely knows. He knows him by name. How? I would guess there's jokes about this guy. How could you not know the short little tax collector from Jericho, whose name means Mr. Squeaky Clean, right? How could you not know this guy? And Jesus says this, I'm not ready to judge this tree by its fruit until I share a meal with him, until I, I start a relationship with him, until I get to know him. Are you tracking with me? If we're going to be the, the kingdom community that God desires, we have to take the time even when we feel like we're trying to pass through. We're just going from point A to point B. I never intended to stop here. This is what Jesus does. He stops and he takes the time. Verse 6. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. I, I was um, reading through my outline this morning and I had this thought in my mind. I can't shake it, so I'm just going to tell you. Any Laker fans in here? Anybody a Laker fan? A few of you. Yeah, you're kind of ashamed of it right now, but the glory will come back. <laughs> There's this one segment in Laker games that, forgive me, I just can't, I can't stand it. I hate it. And it's the segment, it's always after the first or second time out. They don't go to a commercial break. They pull the cameras back, and what do they do? They show you all the celebrities that go to Laker games, right? It's always like, oh, Matt Damon's here with another girlfriend. And like, oh, all these famous people. And all they're doing is like trying to show you, look, the Lakers hang out with the rich and famous, right? Why? Because the rich and the famous like to hang out with the rich and the famous, right? In this case, Zacchaeus is rich and notorious, and he wants to hang out with the famous guy. I don't think Jesus qualifies as rich. So it says he comes down and he welcomes him gladly. Of course he does. This little guy finally gets in front of Jesus. He's just curious. He jumps up in a tree. Jesus comes that way, and oh my goodness, I guarantee when Zacchaeus woke up that morning, he didn't feel like he was about to host the most famous guy to come to town in a long time. He's sitting courtside. <laughs> Verse 7, all the people saw this, and they began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Of course they say that. Of course they do. They finally have this charismatic, powerful figure, Jesus. Isn't he supposed to be on our side? This is the kind of guy we want to keep out. This is the kind of guy, Jesus, when he gets down from the tree, you're supposed to have this like head-on encounter. Let me give you a piece of my mind, right? Let me show you the full power of heaven to put you in your place. That's what everybody wants. This guy has extorted people and backstabbed people. He's been a traitor to his own people. I, I am not Jewish, but from everything I've read this week, uh, apparently to, be, to, 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 to betray your own people when you are Jewish is an enormous deal. And that's what he's done. And all these people are looking for blood, and this is what Jesus says, I just want to eat a meal with you. And their response is, seriously? I thought you were on our team, and now you're betraying us. Verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. I want to point something really right in front of our face out to us. The only words that Jesus has spoken so far is, Zacchaeus, can you get down? I want to share a meal with you. He hasn't said, Zacchaeus, let's go through the divine checklist that God faxed me of all the things you've ever done wrong, and let's take account of them all. He doesn't say, Zacchaeus, I've heard the jokes about you, and I want to figure out what's true and what's not. He doesn't say, Zacchaeus, it's time for some judgment. All Jesus said was, I want to take the time, even though I was planning on passing through, I want to take the time to eat a meal with you and get to know who you are. And this is Zacchaeus' response. Now, as you read it on the screen, I, I think there's kind of two options. Either Zacchaeus has like a really, really stupid PR guy who's like, hey, Zacchaeus, we need to get some like approval ratings going in the right direction for you, so why don't you give some of what you've stolen back? Or you can just look up here and see the amount of money he's committing to give back is he's going to give up a lot of his money. This is what I see. He, he stands up before the Lord. He says, Lord, look, right now, 
I want to commit in front of the whole crowd that I have cheated and extorted and backstabbed and betrayed, I want to give half of my possessions to the poor. The very next thing he says is, and if I have cheated anybody, I think this is rhetorical. If I, the chief tax collector, have ever cheated anybody, everyone's saying like, yeah, he has. Got my sister's cell phone last Sunday. <laughs> and if I cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay it back four times the amount. This is, this is his response. Zacchaeus got out of bed curious. Jesus is coming into town. I've heard about him. He goes into the crowd. He can't see him because he's too short. He's probably surrounded by people who are elbowing him extra hard and whispering things under their breath. He doesn't give up. Instead, he runs ahead. He dishonors himself. He climbs a tree just so he can get a glimpse of Jesus. That was the plan for the morning. And where does it end up? It ends up with Jesus. Not only in front of all of these people that I've wronged, do I want to repent and admit my mistake? I want to make it right. I want to be reconciled to them. Is this amazing? This is a beautiful story. And it all starts because he's curious enough to just go and see. The story uh, wraps up and ends this way. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That is cool. I, I want us to notice something that Jesus just said. He just said in front of all the people who have been betrayed by their Jewish brother that this man is a son of Abraham. This is a way of saying that this man belongs in the people of God. As a community of people who are doing life together, as we seek after what God would have for us, I think we have to take note that there are people that God has made room for in the kingdom that maybe we don't really like very much. And you know what Jesus says about them? He doesn't say, oh, Zacchaeus, I really want to let you in, but you might not be that popular. Let's do a poll. Let's do a Facebook poll and see like where you are. And if you get to 40%, maybe we'll let you. He just says, this guy right here and right now, he's a son of Abraham. He's in. He's in. I, I want to wrap up by leaving you with um, just three things that we've covered this morning that I think are important for us. Uh, the first is this. This sermon literally started with curiosity. It started with a question of an eighth grader who said, what does Zacchaeus' name mean? I stand up here and I got to tell you, I, I'll admit that I've been guilty of squelching curiosity. Of saying, I want to speed up this process. Quit being so curious. Quit asking questions you shouldn't ask. I need your behavior to change. I need it now. I want you to look a certain way and do a certain thing. But curiosity is beautiful. It's, it's an element of a community of followers of Jesus that are willing to say, I got some hard questions. I got some things that don't totally make sense, but I, I want to be curious among people. I don't want to be pushed out. Where do you stand on curiosity? Where's your curiosity? You are allowed to be curious. The curious guy in this story, he's winning. I, I was thinking of a title for the sermon, and I thought, Curiosity Killed the Cat but it saved the tax collector. So if you like sermon titles, that's the sermon title for this morning. Uh, curiosity is such a big part of following Jesus. It's asking questions. It's being okay with, ooh, are we allowed to say that at church? God can handle it. God can handle the big questions. You, you are welcome to be curious. The second thing is this, and this is not a challenge at all. This is actually, uh, this is an encouragement and a big huge thank you. The second thing I read in the Zacchaeus story is this, that Jesus is telling us you cannot be caught judging trees without knowing their fruit. Don't get into the business of judging people without even knowing anything about them or even taking a really quick second just to assume you know everything about them. Jesus is saying take time to know people. This could really easily take on the tone of Get time, take time to know people, but I want to tell you, this church is awesome at that. Pat yourself on the back. Literally pat yourself on the back. You, you deserve it. This church is a place where people come in, and I've, I've seen some things around here where I just think, wow, 
on first glance, that, that looks like a pretty rough person. I can't believe how beautiful it was that people got to know them and brought them into this community. Not all churches are like that. So uh, I, I just say, good job. Keep doing that. The third thing that I, I want to point out as we wrap up is this. At the beginning of this sermon, I, I challenged you to think about this old story of Jericho, of walls coming down. And I challenge you to think, what walls in this story is Jesus tearing down? Here's the walls that I see. I see Jesus demolishing the wall of who's in and who's out. If it was up to the crowd, Zacchaeus is out. I don't even care if he repents. He's out. He's done too much damage. He doesn't belong. And I see Jesus saying, that way of life is not going to be for you. Not if you're going to be a community that takes seriously following after me. This is what the community looks like. The walls and the divisions between us. The things that separate us. Differences of opinion. Different thoughts. Different past stories. Jesus is taking down those walls. And he's going to do it whether we like it or not. The second thing is, I think he's taking down a wall that's not just us versus them. But it's a wall of false security. It's a wall of saying, as long as I'm in with the crowd, and I'm safe right here, I don't have to deal with Zacchaeus. And this is what I think the story is telling us. There's no such thing as this false security. It's false. To follow Zacchaeus' example, climb up in a tree, you guys. Get a vantage point of Jesus. Take a look at him from all sorts of different eyes and angles. The walls will come down. This church is awesome at letting God bring down the walls. I have one last thing for you, and I would like to close with this. This sermon started with a question. What does Zacchaeus' name mean? Well, it means pure and clean and without contamination. That's what his name means. Until his encounter with Jesus It didn't matter what his name meant because his actions, the fruit that came out of him, were the opposite of his name. What Jesus has done is given Zacchaeus permission to live into the name he was given. In Jesus, Zacchaeus is clean. He is pure and he is without contamination. I I, want to close with this thought before I pray with you. If I was not given 45 minutes, if I was given two minutes, this is the message I would have told you. There are many of us in this room who have a name, we have an identity, we have a reputation, and we feel like we've ruined it. It's beyond repair. It can't be fixed. I think at the core of the message of Zacchaeus, this is the message. All of you are pronounced clean and pure and without contamination because of the empty grave of Jesus. That's the message. You are Zacchaeus. That is your name. If you come before Jesus in your curiosity and say, I just want to be close to you, and when he says, well, I want to eat a meal at your house, you can say, I'm ready to host you. If that's where you're at, that is your name. It's not a, if you do this and if you do that. If you're ready to host Jesus, your name is Zacchaeus. You are pure, you are clean. There's nothing you have ever done that gets to define your identity any more than that. The God who created you pronounces you clean and pure and without contamination. And that is yours this morning if that's something that you would like to claim for yourself. I'm going to pray for you, but I I just want to close by saying this. There will be some people up here in the front. If you'd like prayer this morning, if you'd like to be curious and ask some questions, come on up. We welcome it. It's not like this weird ritualistic like religion thing where only like the super holy go up front. What did I just tell you? You're all holy under the lordship of Jesus. He's pleased with you. If you have a prayer request, if you have something heavy, if you have something to celebrate that no one celebrated, come talk to someone up here. We would love to speak with you. In true bridge fashion, would you stand with me as we uh, pray and dismiss? If you're new with us, one of the things we like to do is just put out open hands. It's not something weird. It's just a physical image right before your very face that, God, whatever you have for me today, I'm open-handed and I'm ready to receive it. God, thank you for these 
brothers, these sisters, these friends of mine. Thank you that because of the blood of your son and the empty grave of your son that each one of us is, is named pure and clean and without contamination. That is our gift, but it's only ours because of what you've done for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for destroying the walls that divide us. God, we are in awe of who you are. We ask this week, Lord, that you would go forth before us, that you would help our roots dive deep into good soil, that we would produce good fruit. And where we're producing poor fruit, God, would we lean into your grace and your forgiveness and especially your peace this week. Thank you for shaping us more and more every day into the people that you created us to be, the pure and the clean ones. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.